Hello, everyone. My name is Andromeda, and I have, for more years than I care to admit, been working with an organization called Youth for Human Rights. I started out when I was young and for many years have been working with it. It is an international organization that has taken upon itself to try and teach our kids about the Universal Declaration of Human Rights with the idea that we're going to create that next generation, that next group of people who are actually going to make the world a better place. And we're not going to have to worry about wars and human rights violations because everyone already knows about them. I'm very fortunate in that in the last few years, I've gotten to be the president for the California chapter of Youth for Human Rights and do activities all throughout California and help with those guys who are working all around the world. So there are chapters all around the world that take this message of human rights and works to teach it to kids. So we're gonna just jump right in to what is the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. I go and teach this to high school classes, to college classes, and you'd be surprised how often I ask, what are human rights? And nobody raises their hand. Or nobody has an answer. Nobody goes, oh, it's this or that. Or I've even literally had somebody say, does that have to do with you have the right to remain silent? Yeah, no. That's a different thing. These are your basic human rights. So back after the world wars were over, the United Nations was formed with the idea that if we all work together, we could prevent another world war, we could prevent more wars. One of the documents that was written is called the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It was spearheaded by Eleanor Roosevelt, who was named as the United States Ambassador to the United Nations. But as soon as the idea was put there, there were many countries and many organizations who were like, yes, this is it, this is what we want to do. And Mrs. Roosevelt even actually said, where, after all, do universal human rights begin? In small places, close to home, so close and so small that they cannot be seen on any maps of the world. Yet they are the world of the individual person, the neighborhood he lives in, the school or college he attends, the factory, farm, or office where he works, such are the places where every man, woman, and child seeks equal justice, equal opportunity, equal dignity, without discrimination. Unless these rights have meaning there, they have little meaning anywhere. Without concerted citizen action to uphold them close to home, we shall look in vain for progress in the larger world. And this is something also written in the preamble that everybody who joins the United Nations, all 190 countries, sign this and say, yes, we agree to this. They actually say, and now I have to find it. The General Assembly proclaims this universal declaration of human rights as a common standard of achievement for all peoples and all nations to the end that every individual and every organ of society keeping this declaration constantly in mind 
shall strive by teaching and education to, res to promote respect for these rights and freedoms. This was written in 1948. We were supposed to take it home and teach it. And we haven't. And you kind of look at the world today, you look at what's happening here in the United States, here in California, all over the world, the refugee crisis, and we didn't teach this document. So people don't know they actually have human rights. So what are the human rights? There are actually 30 human rights listed in this document, believe it or not, that every one of us has. And not only do we have it for ourselves, but we have it for other people. There's one in particular, I'm going to jump ahead because I will go over them. There's one, it's right number 24. And basically, in essence, it's called, we call it, in the, my organization that uses this, we call it the right to play. It's the idea that everybody should have some relaxed time. Everybody should get to hang out. So this is where I get to teach to kids. They go, oh, I have the right to play. Why am I doing homework at night? Why am I doing anything else but hanging out? And why do I have to go to school? This is where we go, yeah, but guess who else has the right to play? And they're like, who? Your parents, your guardians. And for the most part, they go, I've even had, what do they do that's play? I mean, parents don't play. This is from high schoolers. This is, I mean, this I would expect this from my six-year-old. But high school parents don't play. And how would I make sure they get a chance to play? And that's when the wheels start turning because an important part of this isn't just for everybody to walk around and say, I have human rights. Don't touch me. You, I'm going to just, you know, that's, that's not the point. The point is actually to treat your fellow humans, every single one of them, with the same respect that is in these human rights. The very first human right, we are all born free and equal in rights and dignity. That, when I, when I talk about that one, people usually go, well, of course, of course that's a human right. We're all born free and equal. Of course, but you have, even here in the United States, things where girls are committed to children marriages at the age of 12. Why? Because they're a girl. They were born a girl, so they don't have quite the same rights. Okay. Children born who end up in the foster care system. That's not exactly a system that takes the best care of them in most places. It's broken. They try. There are now. I have to say there are some amazing people in the foster care system who work really, really hard to try and make it as good as they can. But it doesn't work. It's these children. Many of them end up. They turn 18, they end up on the street because that's when the foster care system stops taking care of them. Only because they were born and either abandoned or something happened with their parents or something like that. This doesn't mean they don't have the same rights as the rest of us because of those sort of things. So surprisingly enough, we are all born free and equal is actually abused here in the United States because of situations like that. Of course, internationally, we all look and, oh my goodness, there are so many international issues. It's beyond the ability to be able to even really think with. The refugee crisis is an unbelievable human rights violation that there aren't even words, really, to describe how horrendous that human rights violation is. War in and of itself because you're part of the tribe that isn't the in-tribe or in-control or more powerful tribe, you end up with less rights. Actually, we're all born free and equal. So why, 
how do we fix that? Well, surprisingly enough, just telling all of those children all around the world and here in the United States that they actually have human rights brings their pride up, brings their <laughs> ability to stick up for themselves and stick up for each other and to realize that, yes, they too deserve the chance to buy a big house if they want to. So they need to get a job, they need to get education, but they have rights to all of those things. So that's actually how we can help with that. I'm just going to cover the first three because the first three are kind of a nutshell. The second one is don't discriminate. Now, that's kind of obvious one. That's the big point that many people yell and scream about. There are so many organizations here in the United States and around the world that scream and yell about you can't discriminate. And this is true. Really, no matter what, however you grow up, whatever choices you make in your life, you shouldn't be discriminated against because of those choices. Sometimes they require some yelling to make it known. But if you take the example of Martin Luther King Jr., Sometimes there doesn't have to be violence involved. You just have to refuse to be quieted is, the, is a good way of putting it. I had a discussion with one student I taught. He was from Nigeria. And he wasn't sure how a group of individuals could make any difference. He wasn't sure how they would ever impinge or ever be loud enough for governments or large gangs and other parties to ever be able to make anything change. And I said, well, here's a, here's a trick. There's this lovely thing called the power of 10. Literally, if I teach 10 people about human rights, and each one of them teaches 10 people about human rights. And each one of those individuals teaches 10 people about human rights. You only have to go 10 deep from me down 10 layers. And you've actually hit the population of Earth. That's it. So if 10 people hear my message today, which hopefully more than 10 will hear, but if 10 people hear the message today, those 10 people, you are now, everybody who's listening, you need to tell 10 people, that's it, just 10 people, about human rights and tell them to tell 10 people. Now, I'm saying it takes 10 layers to reach the population of Earth. If we did that in a smaller country like Nigeria, it would only take four layers. If every single person who learned about human rights decided to go out and teach just 10 people, then they would all know. And then that group is such a large number that it would make a difference. It would be too large to ignore. You would be too many people. You couldn't say, oh, no, that's just a small group over there. We'll, we'll pretend we don't hear them. We'll just pretend that they're not there. No, if this group is so large that you can't do that. And it only takes those steps, 10 people. And then you can make your voice heard so that you know, OK, there is this group that you can't discriminate against for whatever reason, whether because they like to eat berries off the bush, and that's why they get discriminated against, to, you know, they're, they have large noses or or dark hair, or blonde hair, or purple skin, or brown skin, or black skin, it doesn't matter. There's this group, and we keep spreading the message, then we can actually do something about it, and you don't have to do anything beyond teaching enough people. The third human right, I'm kind of going off on tangents, I apologize, but it's fun. The third human right is the right to life. We all have the right to life and to live in freedom 
and safety. That's the essence of the third human right. So they all work together. You have, we are all born free and equal in rights and dignity. You have don't discriminate and you have the right to life. Those are a basic from which a foundation, a further foundation can be built. And there are another 27 human rights listed out in this document, document. But those first three say that a human life, once arrived, <laughs> however it arrives, doesn't matter. A human life, once it's arrived and is now growing in any form or shape, is a human life that has to be treated with respect, has to be treated with dignity, has to be treated like it's worth anything, something. There's, there's no life, there's no group of life that isn't worthy of the right to life, isn't worthy to not be discriminated against because we're all born free and equal. There is this one little story that we, that we um, use to help make points about the human rights. And this will be interesting since I don't have anybody to tell the story to and give feedback to, but I'm going to just go ahead and read. Basically, I am going to read eight facts about a man. His name is John Howard Griffin. And as I read the facts, you have to think about what ethnic background do you think this person is. And I'll tell you what are the most common ones I, he I hear after I read through these eight facts. So these eight facts are, John Howard Griffin was born in Texas in the United States in 1920. John's father worked for a grocery business. John graduated from a school in France where he did work in exchange for his schooling. John worked as a reporter at a magazine called Sepia, read by African American people. Sepia is a yellowish or reddish dark brown color. So the magazine was called Sepia, read by African American people. John's wife was named Elizabeth. John had four children. Some people didn't like John because of how he looked and wouldn't let him into their restaurant. And when he had problems in the United States, John moved with his family to Mexico. So those are eight facts about John Howard Griffin. Born in Texas, his father worked for a grocery business, graduated from school in France. He worked as a reporter for a magazine called Sepia. His wife was named Elizabeth. He had four children. Some people didn't like him and wouldn't let him into their restaurants. And when he had problems, he moved to Mexico. So then the, the drill is, okay, so what is his ethnic background? Most commonly, I hear African-American. I hear Mexican. I also hear, I've heard Irish. And a few, those are the three most common ones. I've, sometimes people really go, well, let's see. He could be from the Caribbeans. He could be um, Native American. There's quite a, a wide list based on just these six facts, which is an interesting drill in and of itself is the fact that you can't really tell someone's ethnic background just by a few facts about a person. So usually, I then let that sit, and we do a whole class where we talk about some of the human rights. We talk about d don't discriminate, the right to life. We also then talk about human right number four, no slavery, which I could do an entire show just talking about the slavery issue. Human trafficking nowadays is quite an issue. I live in California. I live in Los Angeles. Los Angeles is one of the top five cities in the United States for human trafficking. It's scary. And so I'm going to have to, we're going to reserve that for a different time. And because that is an entire show. The idea is no slavery. Back in the day when they wrote this, they were thinking of, you know, the African-American slaves and those sort of things. But it continues now today through labor, the labor trafficking, child workers 
and the human trafficking issues, which is now the second uh, most profitable crime in the United States is human trafficking. So we talk about that. I talk about that with kids, depending on the age group, how deep we get into it. And number five is no torture, which we have the bigger things like um, the military's use of torture on other human beings. We also have domestic violence. We also have abusing your children. You know, this is, no torture doesn't just mean those big issues. This does mean that little stuff at home too. So we usually talk about human right number two, don't discriminate. Human right number three, the right to life. And human right number four, no slavery. And human right number five, no torture. And then I read the story of who John Howard Griffin actually is, which I'll go ahead and read so you can find out who he is. So John Howard Griffin, born 1920, died 1980, was best known as a writer. He was born in Dallas, Texas to Jack Walter Griffin and Lena May Young. His father was a grocery salesman. His mother was a musician. When John was 15, he wanted to go to boarding school, a school where students also live and eat away from home. He wanted to go to boarding school in France, but he did not have money to pay the fees. So he made a deal to work at the school in exchange for schooling. After graduating, he stayed in France to study medicine, the arts, cultures, and the thoughts of man. After a while, John returned to the United States, where he met and married Elizabeth Holland in 1952. He had many interesting experiences while living in France, the South Pacific, and the United States, and he eventually became a reporter for Sepia, a monthly magazine written for African Americans. In 1959, John was assigned to investigate the high suicide rate of Southern U.S. blacks. The Southern United States had a history of keeping black people as slaves. By the 1950s, slavery had long been abolished, but the law still did not provide for equal rights. For all Americans. The everyday attitudes of many people made it difficult for African Americans to have their human rights. People all over the United States and the world closed their eyes to the injustices or thought that discrimination had very little to do with their own lives. But John didn't agree. To understand the situation better, John felt he needed to live the life of a black person in the South. While he could certainly travel and live in the South for a while, there was one problem. John was not black. With the help of a doctor, John was able to turn his skin dark so that his skin was a beautiful brown color. Then he shaved his head and began his exploration of the African-American experience of his time. He rode buses and stayed in the black sections of town. He expected to find hardship and prejudice, but... What he found was actually worse. People called him horrible names. It was impossible to find a job or even a restroom. The simplest task was made difficult by prejudice and hatred towards him by strangers. After a few weeks, he was weary and defeated, but he continued occasionally staying a night or two with a friend to refresh his spirit and sleep in a comfortable bed. In time, very depressed and exhausted from life as a black man, Jeff John briefly stopped taking his medication and let his skin lighten to its normal white color. He then tried another experiment and went back and forth between cultures, going to a place as a white man and then returning as a black man. He did this several times and observed that when he was black man, other blacks treated him with friendship and care while the whites treated him with contempt. On the other hand, when he returned to the same place as a white man, he was treated with respect by the whites and with fear and distrust by the blacks. John realized the blacks and whites didn't understand each other and needed to find a way to communicate tolerantly with each other. So he wrote about this experience for his magazine, Sepia. And then he published a book in 1961 called Black Like Me. It was not his first book or his last, but human rights advocates say it was his most important. News of his book spread like wildfire. While many people congratulated him, there were some who hated him for telling it like it was. 
In Mansfield, Texas, where he lived with Elizabeth and their four children, he and his family were threatened. Some people threatened to cut him into pieces. Some hung a life-size doll of him from a stoplight in the main street and burned it, while others burned crosses to show they hated him. It finally became so bad that John moved his family to Mexico for safety until the situation cooled down. Despite everything, John did not hate the people who had shown so much hate towards him. As he explained to a young black boy shortly after he moved to Mexico, discrimination is a response that is not natural in blacks or whites, but is taught by society. For the rest of his life, John Howard Griffin worked instead to teach tolerance and understanding to people of all colors. So based on your on the eight facts I had told you before, most people thought he was African American or Mexican. He was it doesn't actually tell his exact ethnicity, but he was a white man living in the United States. But what's most important to me about what this story is how he as I've seen and as many people have seen that discrimination is a response that is not natural in blacks or whites. It is taught by people, by our society. So as a society, we have to unteach that. I was very fortunate to grow up with parents who understood and knew about these issues and understood that it was something you had to actually teach your kids. You had to actually make sure they knew that all humans were humans, that we should treat everybody the same. My parents were very much like that. My favorite story, which I'll tell real briefly before we go to a break, is I was about 12 years old. I was in a big department store trying on shoes. My little sister was with me, and she was running and being a rascal, so my mom had to be paying attention to her, and she said, go find the shoes you want. I'm like, okay, found the shoes. The guy helped me. He went to the back to find my size, and then he didn't come back. And it took a couple of minutes. My mom comes over. Where's the guy? I don't. He went to go find my size, and he hasn't come back. I've just been sitting here. So she went and grabbed somebody else and said, so there was a guy helping my daughter, and he seems to have vanished. And the second guy she brought said, well, what does he look like? I'm, oh, he's about as tall as my mom. He has dark hair. He's wearing a nice suit. Uh, I couldn't remember much else. And the second guy's looking at me like, okay, well, that basically describes pretty much everybody in here. And then he comes walking out of the door, and I'm like, oh, that's him. The second guy looks at me and goes, that's him? I'm like, yeah, that's, that's him. So he comes over, he finished, we buy the shoes, we leave, and I go, Mom, why why did he look at me like that? You know, I, I don't understand. She said, well, you forgot to mark in your list of the ways he looked, one of the things you forgot, one of his distinguishing features, that's how she phrased it, his distinguishing feature was that he was black. Oh, apparently he was the only black man who worked in that entire area, and I couldn't remember that because he was just another human. But the other thing that my mom emphasized is it was just a distinguishing feature, the same as the fact that he had black hair or blonde hair. He had blue eyes or green eyes. He had dark skin or white skin. He had, you know, medium brown skin. He had olive skin. It was just a distinguishing feature, and that is how I raised Rays. So when I had kids, that's when I want to make sure my kids actually really understand that they're just distinguishing features. And you can't tell, you can't make a decision about somebody based on a few facts that you may know about them. I think that's a great point for a break.
indeed. The world would be a better place. You know? As he pulls from my pen, pain pulls from my heart. Knowing this kid somewhere that actually starved. Take the time out, close your eyes, just picture this. No color, no hate, no assists or differences. TV is filling me with scenes of negativity, but we can control it if we cooperate willingly. We came a long way, but got so much further to go. Guns kill, but hatred destroys us the most. And the problem could never be solved, you see. Human rights define the word equality. If we don't respect and love each other, we're just living a lie. Because United starts with you and I, you feel me? Walking free to talk, free to dance, free to jump and free to prance. And what I'm saying, gotta keep it together, no matter how bad the weather. It will be all right, keep it tight, cause we all got our freedom rights every day, from the night to the broad daylight. Don't discriminate, learn to appreciate, so you don't have to imitate. Don't be the one to hate, it's never too late. You got the right to life, innocent to prove the guilty. You can say what you like, gotta get the education. Don't throw it away, know your human rights, cause it can help you someday. I actually love that music video and that song is a great song that we use when we go specifically middle school and elementary schools and we're talking about bullying the idea that bullying is actually a form of a human rights violation so we get to go in and talk and teach human rights and actually reduce the bullying there was a great story I like stories. There's a great story of a young young girl. She was about eight. She had quite a, a lisp and got teased about it a lot at school to the point where she would come home in tears and she was very unhappy, didn't want to go to school anymore. And the mom 
wanted to do something about it. So she was researching on the internet, what can I do to help my kid so that she doesn't get bullied? And she came across our program, the Youth for Human Rights program online, and she got her educator kit. We have a whole kit which we'll send out for free. It's got the each of the human rights broken down into really easy to understand basic principles and we have a lessons plans and ideas and things you can do to teach human rights to kids. So she did this in the school and the teasing completely stopped. The little girl stopped being teased at all or bullied at all for her lisp. So much so that the little girl who was also taking taekwondo classes told the mom, you need to go teach this in the taekwondo classes too because, you know, every now and then I get teased there. So the mom went and got with the sensei and he totally agreed. He was like, yes, let's do that. And so teaching human rights actually stops bullying and the United song, which was written by kids, and there's a music video that goes with it, which was directed all by teenagers I think the oldest person who worked on it was 21. All the singers, the music, everything, they made this great music video. So in the time I have left, we'll continue on with some of the other human rights. There's another chunk of human rights, which I'll just go through the chunk really quick. These are, again, I'm just giving you kind of the nutshell of each what each article is. So human right number six, you have rights no matter where you go. Any country, wherever you're traveling, any state, any city, you have rights no matter where you go. Human right number seven, we are all equal before the law. No matter how much money you might have, you're actually all equal. So sometimes see that violated. Human right number eight, your human rights are protected by law. Now this is especially true in the United States. The United States has some of the best laws that protect against human rights, but... Is it perfect? No. And are there countries out there where basically have almost no laws or laws which actually work in reverse? Yes. But the idea is that if they joined the United Nations and signed on to this document, then they agreed that human rights are protected by law. Human right number nine, no unfair detainment. You might have guess from the theme here, these are all having to do with your legal and rights within the court systems or legal systems of your country. So number nine was no unfair detainment. Nobody has the right to put us in prison without good reason and keep us there or to send us away from our country. Again, even here in the United States, you have instances of that being violated. It sort of ties into the don't discriminate aspect of it in that discrimination can sometimes result in people being detained who maybe had no good reason to be detained. Then we have the right to trial, number 10. So you have the right to actually be tried. You shouldn't be sitting, even if you are being accused of something that is um, a crime, I guess is the best word, <laughs> even if you're being accused of a crime and there is evidence to get you, against you, you do need to get a trial. You have a right to a trial for human right number 10. And you, but human right number 11, you're always innocent till proven guilty. Now this is true in the United States, is supposedly supposed to be how it works. Is it perfect? No. Could we make it better? Yes. So human rights 6 through 11 have a lot to do with your rights in your legal rights and your rights to representation, your, light, your right to um, be treated fairly in, in the legal system. Right number 12 is the right to privacy. Now, this is interesting because I actually worked in the area of internet privacy for many years. Uh, I'm not a lawyer. I am I do social media work and I do um, work in how does a person end up getting shown and represented online. Now, what may be funny is that 
you actually have cases where somebody else put something on you on about you on the internet which violates your privacy. For example, there was one cycle I worked on where with a young girl who she had gotten um, sexually abused in school and there was a trial and the court documents were supposed to be sealed and somebody somewhere put some of the information online. So when you search the child's name, this came up. Obviously, a huge right, uh, a huge violation of privacy. So while we had the lawyers and all of that working to take the document down, there was other proactive stuff we tried to do to just try and make it so it was buried under so much other information nobody would ever read it or find it. And that's how that's one of the human rights that I actually first discovered. I didn't even know I was working on a human right. And then I went, oh, I am actually am the right to privacy. Then we have 13 and 14. Human right 13 is the freedom to move and human right 14 is the right to seek a safe place to live. So we have the right to move and the right to leave, the right to come back, the right to find the safest place, the safest environment for you, yourself, your children, your family. And this is the refugee crisis in it's the best and most, one of the loudest and hardest to understand problems we have right now is that. People do have the right to seek a safe place to live. It is a human right. They should be allowed to do that. And they have a right to try and come to another country. Does the country have a right to make sure that the people who come in aren't going to cause it harm? Sure, there's a balance to everything. But you need to make sure you somehow find the right balance. Because number 15 is the right to a nationality. So you have the right to belong to a country. You have the right to call a country a home, your home. Some people are unable to live in their country at the time that they're calling, they wish to call it their home. But the idea is that you can still have that as a nationality. You can still have that. There's nothing that says you have to come to another place and then say, oh, I'm no longer that thing anymore. You actually do still have a right to nationality, no matter what. So human right 13, 14, and 15 all have, you have to do with the fact that you can move around, you can seek for a safe to, place to live, and you have a right to nationality. If you want to change your nationality, you have a right to do that. There may be steps involved in how you go about accomplishing that, but you do have the right to do that. Number 16 is generally we refer to it as the marriage and family. You have a right to to get married to whoever you want to and you have a right to raise a family and nobody else is going to come in and say you don't have a right to be happy <laughs> to create a family to be with a person you love and the idea also that you have just because you got married doesn't mean that you gave up some of your human rights, which is what happens in some countries where the woman, mostly, when she marries, is now under the command and order of a husband. And that's not how it's supposed to work either. You actually still are two human beings. You didn't suddenly become not a human being because you got married. So your rights, whether you're married or separated, are the same. And is what that one covers. Human right number 17 is the right to own your own things. This is another one that when I teach it with kids, they really like. Because then they're like, yeah, this is my stuff. And yeah, it is their stuff. Uh, I try to do this with my kids. And it's hard. I have three kids. I have a 12-year-old. And then I have a 7 and a 5-year-old. And there are times when you give them something and then you know that what they're about to do is going to break it. I try really hard. It's theirs now. It's a human right. I gave it to them. If I really gave it to them and they break it, that it's theirs. 
If there's something, and this is the trick I personally use, so this is kind of just a personal note. If there's something that I want the kids to be able to play with, but I don't want them to break it and I want to be able to keep the rules in on it, it's still mine. I'm sharing it. That's that's how I work it. But if, for the most part, if I give them stuff. And once I give it to them, they can do whatever they want with it. Furniture in the house is mine, but all the toys in their room, it's theirs. They can break it. They have a right to your own things. But this is but I've taught it both ways because now they know it's mine and I have a right to my things too. And that they need to respect my rights. Number 18 and 19 also sort of tie together. 18 is freedom of thought. I like that we use the word thought and then use this because this does include religion. This recruit includes spirituality. This includes atheism, which doesn't like to be grouped with religion. But if that's how they want to think, they have freedom of thought. It doesn't it doesn't um, get forced or you, you can't say, oh no, you don't get you don't get to believe in that. You don't get to think that way. No, everybody has the freedom to think however they want to think. Now ideally they're willing to take on new information and relook at their thoughts, but hey, technically they can think whatever they want to think. They also have the right to change their religion. So if they decide that, you know, they grew up in a Catholic household, but then they want to change to Judaism, then they can. That's their choice. So 18 is freedom of thought, and then 19 is freedom of expression. So now you can think what you want, but you can also say. Now this is, there is this gray line in this one, in that at what point do you turn over into hate speech? And that is a that is a hard thing to define. There isn't a hard black line that says, okay, once you say this, you've now crossed over into discrimination and hate speech. Well, before that, you were saying freedom of expression. But the balance really comes from the fact that you have to think about the person you're talking to, the people you're talking to. Because human rights, again, isn't just about yourself. Human rights is about how you treat your fellow humans. So while you can say what, whatever you want to say, you have to be willing for it to have an effect on the person across from you. And if it's something where you're saying, well, this person's bad, or I think if you believe that that white wall over there is actually yellow, that you're crazy, the person who thinks the white wall is, the white wall is yellow might get offended. And you have to be and go, okay, well, I might actually upset that person. And does that violate their human rights? So it's, it's sort of a, a decision you have to make within, <laughs> within yourself. You have to decide where, where do I cross the line from my right to say whatever I want to say and their human rights in and of themselves. Freedom of thought and freedom of expression. Number 20 is the right to public assembly, and number 21 is the right to democracy. The idea that as a group we can get together and say, this is right, this is wrong, we really like this Christmas tree, but we don't like that Christmas tree, or we really like that menorah, but not this menorah, or whatever you want, <laughs> whatever you want to say, you have a right to, gr to come together as a group and say what you want to say, and you have the right to, to democracy in your every country of the world has a right to democracy. Number 22 and 23. Number 22, we generally call social security. Basically the idea that once you've contributed to society, you should have the chance and opportunity to rest and be taken care of. And if you get temporarily ill, then you have the right to be taken care of until you get back on your feet. Now the idea is that you do get back on your feet and you eventually contribute again. But you do have the right to that. And so in 22, 23 is workers' rights because obviously, and this sort of ties into the labor trafficking, 
you have the right to, <laughs> to work but not be, a, not be turned into a slave. I jumped to this one earlier, number 24, the right to play. You, get, you should get some goof off time. Again, you have a right to work, but you have a right to goof off. Number 25, food and shelter for all. That one's a hard one. We have quite a homeless issue here in the United States, here in Los Angeles. Um, this is an issue, and this is a human right that they do. Everyone should get food and shelter. How we go about providing that is a system that needs to be worked out. It's, it's an inefficient system right now. We need to get a better one. I'm going to have to wait to talk about that more some other time. <laughs> Number 26, the right to education. This is, this one, um, I guess it's sort of a um, hard one to, for me to talk about because I actually am very passionate about this one, but, and I only have a few minutes left. <laughs> But the right to education anywhere in the world, everybody, boy or girl, should have the right to be educated. Number 27 is copyright. It means once you've created something artistically, it's yours and you have the rights to it. Nobody should steal your copyrights. I'm gonna, the last three are all basically about how we want to grow up. In our, in our world. Number 28, we want a fair and free world. And again, sort of a basic one. I like how these start with three basics and sort of end with three basics. There's very specific ones in the middle, but we want a fair and free world. That's a general, that's, it's like peace on earth. That's what we want. Number 29 is responsibility. And this is where you now need to teach 10 people because we can't just, you, can't, you don't write a document and then leave it on a table and then nobody ever is going to know that it's there. You have to tell other people about it. And number 30, the way that it ends is no one can take away your human rights. That's all of these together, you end up with the fact that these are your human rights and there is no dictator, there is no bigger meaning looking person, there is no parent, there is no boss, there is no anybody who can take those rights for you. These are your 30 human rights, no matter what. My mission in this work so I, I volunteer. This is a work I do as my volunteer work because that's how important and passionate I am about it is to get every child in the world. So I'm going to start with Los Angeles. But I'm going to make sure that they all know this, that they all know their human rights. After classes where I, I give out, we have the little booklets. Youth for Human Rights has a booklet that we hand out to the kids that goes over the 30 human rights. We tell them they take it home. After the classes, though, when we've gone over them, they look at them and they, they fill out these little feedback forms for me. They're anonymous, so they don't have to put their names. And all of them, basically all of them say, why has nobody told me about this before? Why is this the first time I am learning about human rights? Why do we not know that there is actually 30 human rights that have already been agreed upon, that have been agreed upon since the late 1940s? Why, why don't we all know this? Why isn't this taught to every person everywhere in every social strata of life? So that is what I want to change is that it actually is taught to everyone in every social strata of life in every way. And everyone learns their human rights because, as I've said, take a moment and imagine what your local community would be like if everyone knew their human rights. Can you even picture the way we would treat each other, the way we would treat ourselves, how we would contribute to society? It would be completely different. Just your community. Now imagine Los Angeles. Now imagine the world. That would, 
that's this huge change. And it's all it takes is education. All it takes is, hey, you know that there's a document that says you have 30 human rights? People, 30 human rights? Yeah. It's And it's really easy. And there's the documents all over the world. The document itself is translated into every language of which the United Nations is part of. Our materials that we use for teaching is translated into 20 languages. The idea that we really do want to increase and teach more and more societies. Our most recent language that we actually just finished this previous year was Farsi. We now have all of these materials available in Farsi to be taught so that you can make sure that our kids grow up knowing human rights. That's my mission. And we went over all of them today, which is a lot to sort of understand all in one bang. So we'll focus on individual ones and group of ones. I'll bring in people we'll be able to talk about them. We'll go over it and get more information on what's happening here in the United States, here in Los Angeles, and all over the world. Then we can actually make a difference and really understand and work with each other to make human rights something that we all know and then this world will be a completely different place and I'll be more than happy to have my kids live in this world where we all know human rights. There you go.
Aung San Suu Kyi, the democratically elected leader of Burma, is currently under house arrest. She is asking her people to dream and fight for a free democratic country. She is the living symbol of this declaration.